I'm going to start by just offering quotes from four of my four of the people I admire. One is W. H. Hudson, who wrote Nature in Downland, founded the RSPB back in the 1890s. He was the only man the Fur Fin and Feather Society would allow to attend their meetings, but that led to the RSPB. He also wrote Nature in Downland, in which presciently, please don't take this the wrong way, he described to Brighton in 1900 as Islington by Sea. Um, he wrote, my flesh and the soil are one. Lady Eve Balfour, who founded the Soil Association and wrote a book called Living Soil, wrote, the health of soil plant, animal and man are one and indivisible. George Osawa was the author of Zen Macrobiotics, which was the philosophy, if you like, yin and yang, that kick-started the younger organic food revolution and healthy eating revolution in the 60s. And he wrote, our body and the soil are united. And Satish Kumar, who recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of Resurgence magazine, uh, based in Dartington, wrote, I propose a new trinity of soil, soul, and society. So what were they saying? I mean, they're all saying, basically, we are soil. Um, I want to sort of try and take an angle on this, looking at my own background. Uh, thanks for calling me a pioneer. And I'm a descendant of pioneers. And my uh, pioneer ancestor was someone called Lars Dugstad, who left a little village like that in Norway when he found out that his younger brother was going to inherit the farm. And so he thought, well, I'll go to America. They, they say there's lots of land there. And he ended up in Wisconsin on 80 acres, living in a brush shelter during the summer and a uh, cave in the ground during the winter. And over 10 years, carved a farm out of wild country, cutting down trees, but trapping water and growing crops and eventually making money and eventually finding a bride in Chicago from who is originally from a village just next to his in Norway and farming. And then his son, my great-grandfather, ended up in Nebraska, which is where I was born. So they were all very proud of their pioneers. But I'd also like to quote Charles M. Russell, who was the cowboy artist who captured the Old West on canvas. And at a big celebratory event, in 1910, he rather sourly got up and said, in my book, a pioneer is a man who turned the grass upside down, strung barbed wire over the dust that was left, poisoned the water and cut down the trees, killed the Indian who owned the land, and called it progress and manifest destiny. And he also added, I haven't put it up there, is if I had my way, none of you sons of bitches would ever come here in the first place. And I can take claim credit for most of that pioneering stuff, but you know, at least my ancestors never killed any Indians. In fact, they got on fairly well with them, and our farm was right on the edge of the Winnebago Indian Reservation, and my mother's high school regularly played them at football. Lyndall Berry also tapped into what was going on in a very simple way. He said, we didn't know what we were doing because we didn't know what we were undoing. And that's really the essence. You know, people just took fertility and soil for granted. And they cut down the trees, and they plowed away. And it wasn't just in America. The same thing was happening on the pampas of Argentina. It was happening on the steppes of Ukraine and Kazakhstan. And it was happening in Manchuria, and also in Australia, where huge amounts of wheat used to be grown until the fertility ran out. In America, that whole Mississippi River Basin area, 80% of the trees had been chopped down by 1920, leaving not very much to hold the soil together. Altogether, with all of the emissions from farming, up till 1980, half of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions above 1850 levels came from agriculture. Since then, agriculture has continued to increase its rate of damage. It's just been outrun by industrialization, fossil fuel burning, transportation, that sort of thing. And the result everywhere was devastation. 
in uh, the Mississippi in 1926, the banks of the Mississippi were very, very high <coughs> it, in December. In January, it rained, and it overran its banks, and it kept raining from April until October of 1927. The Mississippi River was 60 miles wide. That's 100 kilometers wide. That's three times the Straits of Dover wide. It wiped out all those ex-slave African-American farmers who'd been given land after the, after the Civil War and created what's called in American history the Great Migration of African-Americans from the South to the cities, Detroit, Chicago, and the North. As if that wasn't enough, a few years later, the soil had given out so much that we had the Dust Bowl. And vast clouds of dust, you know, my mother used an inhaler most of her life because she inhaled so much dust as a child, but vast clouds of dust destroyed the farms of thousands, tens of thousands, created a quarter of a million refugees from Oklahoma to California alone, of whom Steinbeck wrote in The Grapes of Wrath. Then you know, Roosevelt decided it's time to do something. So despite the opposition of Congress, who thought he was some kind of communist, he employed three million men in the Civilian Conservation Corps who went out and planted 10 billion trees from Canada down to Texas to help to hold down the soil and try and restore in some way the damage that had been done. And it was, it was effective, but when the price of grain went up during World War II, when Europe's battlefields we replaced growing fields, food fields, arable fields. A lot of that got, the trees got taken down again because, you know, people wanted to grow wheat while they could. And around that time, I was born uh, in 1944, around the time that Lady Eve Balfour published The Living Soil, which was her book theorizing and very heavily influenced by Sir Albert Howard, who invented the compost, the whole concept of compost, um, theorized about what was going on in the soil. You know, they didn't have the microscopes and the technology we have now, but they still could just see from what was happening that the soil was alive. And meanwhile, in Peckham, a woman called Innes Pierce had established that if you took the poorest people in one of the poorest and most deprived neighborhoods of London and taught them how to eat properly, how to cook food, what nutrition was about, how to maintain basic levels of hygiene, that marital stability increased, kids did better in school, the, guy, the husbands stayed in their jobs and didn't leave, abandon their families. So it was all pretty impressive. And Beveridge mapped out the NHS he assumed that this healthier approach, and all the food during the war was homegrown and very healthy too. People ate a lot of vegetables because there wasn't much imported food because of submarines. Um, they assumed the NHS, their budget showed declining expenditure all through the 50s as Britons got healthier and healthier. Uh, then the first wimpy bars opened in 1958. The Labour government that came in in 1945 uh, came in on the promise of Tom Williams, who was their Minister of Agriculture and a former coal miner, that they would nationalize Britain's farmland. Well, you just can't get away with that. There would have been a revolution of the landowning classes. But he did the next best thing. He nationalized agriculture. And he did it by fixing prices for dairy, for grain, for everything that came off the farm. He subsidized fertilizer, he subsidized mechanization, which replaced farm labor, but meant that you had to go down the route of herbicides and pesticides because you know, chemicals are the only replacement for labor, mechanization, not so much. And if you didn't agree with it, the threat was there that you, you would have your land taken away from you. And that combined with the fact that the NHS got to a certain extent hijacked by the medical profession and wasn't so much a health service as a disease service led us to where we are today. So we came along, my brother and I, in 1967 
introducing the macrobiotic diet to try and get back to a healthier way of eating and only selling organic food whenever we could and supporting organic growers in order to try and reverse this tide of destruction. We had a lot of opposition. The press uh, opposed us. Oh, that was our, yeah, that was our restaurant. And that was, microbiotics was, you know, the key points we all take for granted now. At the time, people thought we were mad or dangerous or bad. Uh, in America, the American Medical Association got the FBI to uh, take away the books from the macrobiotic bookshop. They came back a few days later. I happened to be there on the day the books were, they had the books, but you weren't, she wasn't allowed to sell them anymore. And they eventually took them away and burned them because they said the cancer could be prevented by healthy diet, which is now NHS policy, but it wasn't then. So they said the hippie diet could be deadly. <coughs> and that it could lead ultimately to death, which you could say about any diet. The real question is how long before that ultimate destination is reached. I'm hanging in there and I've been macrobiotic for 50 years. The countervailing opinion also worked really well. My brother struck up a very good relationship with John Lennon, who was a regular customer in our restaurant. My brother also published a magazine called Harmony, which John really appreciated. And he gave my brother a lovely little cartoon thanking him for macrobiotics. Oops, am I jumping ahead? Yes. Uh, thanking him for macrobiotics, eating brown rice, and the health benefits that he and Yoko enjoyed as a result. As Peter mentioned, we had a shop in Portobello Road, but preceding that was the original grain shop in all Saints Road, just off Portobello Road, and just next door to the Mangrove Restaurant, which some of you may have heard of. We published a magazine called Seed. You can still stick with that headline, Garbage Grub, How the Poor Starve on Rich Foods. You know, things have changed, but not that much. And I wrote a book called About Macrobiotics, which was translated into quite a few languages and still is in print in Israel and Portugal. So what is soil? Well, you know, there wasn't soil when the earth began. It was rock. And the rock was eaten by fungi that waited for the rain, which came through a very carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. So it was carbonic acid by the time it hit the rock. And that would dissolve the rock and provide them with a little bit of carbon so that they eked out a miserable living on, but they were life on Earth. It was the beginning of life on Earth. Then, uh, and I realize we're in the Breithelm Center, but Turner, the artist, had a, had a, oh, that's, um, um, Turner, the artist, on his deathbed said, the sun is God. And following that line, uh, one, uh, three, 30, 300 million years after rock was formed, the first bacteria emerged that could convert sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into carbohydrate. And that was where we got our first sugar. The very earliest food of life was C6H12O6. Well, when the mycorrhiza, I saw what was going on, and I'm making this up now, but there's no better explanation. When they saw it was going on, they locked those little bacteria into cells, which we now call chloroplasts, and they strung them together in what you might call chain gangs and sent them out to harvest as much of this precious sugar as they possibly could. And strung them together like that and eventually created plants, primitive plants like horsetail and then fan-shaped plants to try and sweep as much carbon dioxide out of the air as they possibly could. Try and so the mycorrhizae then had these wonderful food gathering tools, plants as we call them, that sucked carbon dioxide out of the air, turned it into sugar, and then drip fed it to them through their roots. Mycorrhizae, these fungi, 
that dominate the undersoil world are called myco because that's fungus, rhizi because they cluster around the roots of the plant because if you're milking a cow, you don't cluster around the head, you cluster around the udders and the roots for the mycorrhizae are where the sugar comes from. They're called arbuscular because they're tree-shaped. My, uh, arbuscular because they're tree-shaped and vesicular because they have little vessels where they store sugar. So they don't want to just be drip-fed sugar and burn it right away. They stick it into these little vessels and then they use it for whatever they need it for. And mostly they distribute it to other organisms in the soil that perform a variety of different functions. But what the mycorrhizae also do is exude something called glomalin. And glomalin is a sticky, gooey substance, but it's a substance in which bacteria are very happy to go forth and multiply. It also sticks soil together so that you get Soil is basically sand or clay or silt. It doesn't have any internal tendency to adhere. This gluey stuff sticks the soil together. And the mycorrhizae then, their roots are a hundredth of the thickness of a human hair, but they slither all through the soil. You have, from that magnification, it may not show it, but you can get eight miles of mycorrhizal filaments of their roots in a cubic inch of soil, so just less than a handful of soil. And then their bacterial allies, actinomycetes, are also shaped in that filamentous way. In fact, they're called actinomycetes because we used to think they were fungi until the microscopes got strong enough to realize they were actually bacteria dressed up as fungi in their, the way they were structured. They make little passages through the soil that allow worms to make bigger passages, that allow water in to percolate water through the soil, and to allow the soil to breathe by allowing air into all the soil, giving you this nice, spongy, ideal soil structure in which plants and the undersoil microbes really thrive. You can see again on that network where the little vesicles are where they keep their sugar around the roots. <coughs> Actinomycetes were one of the, they are the, when you smell earth, that smell of fresh earth is the actinomycetes. They give off that smell and they, they go further than the mycorrhizae into the soil dissolving rock phosphorus, turning it into phosphate that the plant can eat, and generally converting inaccessible nutrients into the right form for the plant. They then give them to the mycorrhizae who give them sugar, and the mycorrhizae give it to the plant who gives the mycorrhizae sugar, and everybody's happy and you've got a thriving soil economy. What actinomycetes also do is chase off intruders, and in fact, Actinomycin is an antibiotic that was made from actinomycetes. It was so powerful that they never used it because it killed too many of the people they tried it. It killed the disease, but it killed the host as well. They found a weak form of actinomycetes called streptomyces, and that's where streptomycin came from. And most of our antibiotics in medicine come from soil bacteria that have these powers. They're, those powers exist to repel pathogenic bacteria and fungi in the soil to keep them away from this food supply. When a plant dies, then those pathogens are welcome to eat the dead bodies because that's otherwise we'd be up to our ears in dead plants. You know, they do need to decompose, but they keep them away from the living ones. What the mycorrhizae also do is trap nematodes. So the orange creatures there are worms about a millimeter long. And nematodes, some of them are good. Some of them eat bacteria and other things, which the mycorrhizae don't particularly want them to do. Some of them eat the roots of plants, which the mycorrhizae don't want them to do. So what the mycorrhizae do, and we know this from tomato growing, is they form little lassoes. They fragrance the lasso with the smell of a tomato root. A little nematode is wiggling through the soil. It's blind, but it can smell tomato. Mm -hmm. Goes straight in. The mycorrhizae slams shut, and 
the filaments of the mycorrhizae go into the worm, take out all its protein. A lot of that is nitrogen that goes straight into the plant. That's an even more enhanced version, a large version of how they do it. So there's a lot. It's a jungle down there. They also produce jasmonic acid. That's a really powerful anti-pathogen substance. When you have a lot of mycorrhizae in the soil, it can increase jasmonic acid by 9%. So when a caterpillar comes along and eats a leaf, it, it tastes this jasmonic acid, it's revolted, and it pulls away. They produce salicylic acid, what we know as aspirin. Um, and what that does is also encourage what's called systemic resistance in plants. So that if one plant is producing salicylic acid, the neighboring plants also start to produce their defensive chemicals because they know something's out there that's wrong. And some of them, I just read this in the New Scientist this week, but it really intrigued me. Uh, oops, jumping ahead of myself again. Mimosa produces hydrogen sulfide. So when a cow or some animal comes to eat a mimosa, it produces this foul-smelling aroma that we associate with human farting, and that repels whatever it is that's trying to eat the mimosa. These are the sensitive plants that also shrivel up in some varieties when they're day. When we make antibiotics out of these soil organisms, they work, but the pathogens that they're designed to fight evolve beyond them. And that's why most of our antibiotics don't work. In the soil, it's very different. The, the resistance, the mycorrhizae and their biological or microbial allies stay ahead. They're constantly changing their DNA to stay ahead of whatever pathogen they're fighting. And that's where we have a problem with modern medicine and why antibiotics don't work is once we're stuck with an antibiotic, you know, nobody seems to be able to find any. Nobody's research isn't really finding them. There isn't that constant dynamic that keeps things healthy. So what happens, why, why, why do we have problems with soil? What kills off all of this activity? The basic problem is nitrate fertilizer. If you feed a plant NPK, sort of chemical fertilizer, the plant thinks, well, why am I pumping my hard-earned sugar in to feed these mycorrhizae when the farmer is giving me all these wonderful nutrients for free? All right, I may not be getting copper and zinc and a few trace elements, but the plant uses that sugar that it was giving to the mycorrhizae to grow itself bigger, and the farmer gets a higher yield. In fact, half of that nitrogen is just washed away. And so the question is, do we really need nitrogen? Because you know, the agrochemical industry will say we do, even though it's leading directly to the destruction of all those soil benefits and the glomalin and everything else that I've been going on about. Of the 150 million tons of nitrogen that are created each year, only 50, one third, come from industrial nitrogen producing, which uses methane and a lot of fossil fuel energy to produce. A lot is just the land itself. The biology of healthy soils and land draws nitrogen out of the air. Forests and pasture and that sort of thing draws nitrogen out of the air. And lightning, when there's lightning, thunderstorms, the lightning converts immediately nitrogen in the air, it's 80% of our atmosphere, into nitrate that comes down in the rain and you get a nice flush of growth. But it's not like a permanent chemical injection. So we're losing our soil and we're losing it at quite a rate. The United Nations have said we have 60 years of farming left if we don't change. Uh, Volkert Engelsmann, who's uh, head of iFoam, put it more succinctly, we're losing 39 football fields a minute. That's a lot of land to just go out of production, especially when we're worried about you know, population increases and pressure on food. About 1.8% of available land is degraded or disappears every year. Now, when it disappears, it's really hard, but 
you know, there's some amazing examples of virtual sand and desert being restored to vitality. So it's not too late. In 2004, people worrying about the future of agriculture got together and created the IAASTD, the International Assessment of Agriculture, Science and Technology for Development. Monsanto, Syngenta, the US Department of Agriculture, the, our Ministry of Agriculture, the EU Department of Agriculture, academics, everybody with an interest in agriculture got together and selected the world's 400 best leading agronomists and agricultural scientists and said, figure out what we should do. They came out with their report in 2010. Two weeks before the report came out, Monsanto and Syngenta both said, this is complete crap and rubbish. These people don't know what they're talking about. Don't pay any attention. The new scientists had a two-page facing debate from the supporters and anti of the report. You can see why they said that. Because the report said subsidies are part of the problem, and that goes back to the 1947 Agriculture Act. The same thing happened all over the world. Green Revolution had unintended consequences that cannot be repaired with genetic engineering. We have to listen to small farmers and look at traditional methods because they managed to keep going a lot longer than we have. We only really started using nitrates in the late 40s and already our soils are practically gone. And reward farmers who prevent climate change. And that is really what I'm going to concentrate on next. I, you didn't mention this, Peter, am the first person to reward farmers who prevent climate change when I launched Whole Earth Corn Flakes. And they were carbon neutral. They were the first carbon neutral food product. And what that meant is, so it's pretty crude, but we planted trees to offset the carbon footprint of the corn flakes. The future forests, the people who did that, who became the carbon neutral company, were rather disappointed when their research came back and they found that because the corn was organically grown, the increase in soil carbon by composting and building up organic matter in the soil almost completely offset all of the carbon involved in tractors and uh, shipping the corn to the factory to make the corn flakes and then the packaging and sending them to people like Infinity Foods and getting them to the ultimate consumer. And that was when the penny dropped for me that if, if, the, if people, if organic farmers got paid for the carbon they sequestered and industrial farmers had to pay for all the greenhouse gas emissions that they were responsible for, the price of organic food would in many cases be cheaper than the cost of industrial produced food because the industrial producers are exporting a huge, terrible, threatening cost to us. So the question is, how can we reward carbon farming? An industrial farm uses 12 calories of fossil fuel to produce one calorie of food. An organic farm uses six calories. This isn't looking at sequestration, because the organic farmer is then offsetting a lot of those emissions by putting carbon in the soil. A farmer with a hoe uses one calorie of their own energy to produce 20 calories of food. So in purely carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas terms, the farmer with a hoe is 240 times more efficient than the industrial farmer. And that, that's what is the love of the issue. And somewhere in with the ISDD said, we have to listen to traditional farmers. Well, we don't own all our food to be grown by people with hoes. Um, it's not a very efficient use, and we've got better technologies now. Uh, the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania, they're now in their 34th year of these trials, and they've shown that after the first few years when yields weren't that good, they've been consistent on yield. They, they roughly used half as much fossil fuel energy to produce the food and they sequestered a ton per hectare of year of carbon, which is a huge offset. So you know, what it says is, again, you know, put a price on carbon and then see what happens. The Wall Street Journal picked up on the story 
and said, can organic farming uh, counteract carbon emissions? The Paris talks in the COP21, as it's called, um, was, has, has covered everything. The Kyoto Protocols, the predecessor 20 odd years ago, didn't include farming or transportation. It also didn't include very many countries. Europe complied. The Americans wouldn't do it because it was, you didn't like being dictated to by the rest of the world. And China and India said we're too small and poor. But so it didn't, never really took effect. This time, 150 or however many countries have signed up and it covers everything. The French have initiated, oh, there we are. The French have initiated something called the four per thousand initiative. Their agriculture minister said, if we, we could sequester all of the annual carbon emissions, if we just increased the organic matter in the soil. This was, the French have been plotting all for quite a while now to make sure that this climate conference isn't a failure and they've been very successful. The French National Assembly said by law there will be a carbon price of at least 56 euros per ton. Well, that's more than it's ever been. You know, the highest it got in Europe with the carbon market was around 32 euros. So they're saying that's the floor price, but it can go higher if demand is there. And the... So they called it the four per thousand. Don't try and read that, please. It's just too, look at me. <laughs> the four per thousand is, they, the French Agronomic Research Institute said, if you increase soil organic matter by 0.4%, that's four parts per thousand every year, that will offset every year the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that's not really hard to do. Rodale, we're doing about one and a half percent a year. So it's not rocket science to achieve 0.4%, but it does mean some changes towards regenerative agriculture. The Regeneration International got on the case. They have the Organic Consumers Association in America, a million consumers. They're the ones who have finally pushed Monsanto into no longer blocking uh, genetic GMO labeling in American food. And I suppose you, most of you know this, Campbell's Soup have now said they are going to declare GMOs on all their products, which means in effect they're taking them out of all their products because they don't want not to sell them. And Vandana Shiva is their figurehead. And when you look at how much damage nitrates and industrial farming is doing, you also need to remember that most farming is not large-scale industrial farming. Only 30% of the world's food is produced by industrial farmers, and most of them are totally helplessly dependent on subsidies. So much so that uh, my cousin Daniel, who farms in Iowa, I mean, grows ethanol because nobody even wants the food he grows. He grows GMO corn that gets converted into ethanol. Said, I don't know what we do without ethanol. So there's plenty of land out there that could be used to grow food and grow it in a sensible way. And instead, we're subsidizing the people who are destroying our future. Small farmers in general are now getting on the bandwagon. The Fair World Project is one example of this. So small farmers realize that there's something in it for them on carbon. So are the big corporations. And Ceres, the lovely named organization of leading Companies including Danone, Unilever, and General Mills have called for carbon pricing. They're happy to go down that road. General Mills have actually taken steps. You know, they own an organic company, Cascadian Farms, and they make Cheerios. They just announced a $100 million program, and they're going to convert 250,000 acres, 100,000 hectares of their supply chain into organic and their head of environment has said, you know, we have to do this for the reasons of climate and soil protection. 